Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are starting something kind of new today. Well, actually, it, it is new today. Uh, I'm not really sure how this is going to go, what direction it's going to take. But last week, uh, in the announcements, uh, you'll actually see it in your bulletin today. Um, we have Ask the Pastor questionnaires over on the credenza over there. And this is your opportunity to ask me a question that you would like to hear addressed. Um, Notice I did not say necessarily answer. Uh, we have two of them today. And I'm going to read these. And then if I know who actually gave me the question, I've written an answer out. And I'll give, the, give this back to whoever submitted it. So the first one is, is Jewish a race or a religion? Yes. That was easy. OK. No, really. It's both. OK, genetically. There is a genetic race that is Hebrew, and I'm 2% that. 2%, I know, I got my DNA checked. Oh, well, it was disturbing. Um, evidently, I, I'm adopted because I don't match up with anyone in my family. But then again, neither do they, so. Um, it is a race. Uh, we know that there is genetics in uh, all throughout Africa where they have been genetically uh, traced, there is actually a village, or it's actually a town in Africa that the rumor had it that they were descended of Jewish lineage. But they all look African. And so it was, okay, well that's just a rumor, it's a tradition. They probably received the word, either the, the Old Testament or, or possibly in the diaspora, somebody came in and, and somehow propagated the, this idea. Well, they actually did genetics on this village, and they found out that they are genetically linked to the Hebrew people. Okay? So, yes, it is a people, but it is also a religion. Okay? And that's where people adhere to the Jewish faith. Um, you can be a proselyte, or you can be born, um, you know, you can be born a Jew because your mom and dad have that genetic predisposition, or you can choose to follow the religion of the Jews. They're very much intertwined. Now, what's really interesting today is that Israel is one of the largest agnostic slash atheistic per capita nations in the world. Per capita. Okay? And we see in Scripture that this is going to happen. As a matter of fact, we see it in the Old Testament. If you do not follow my decrees, this is what's going to happen. We see in the New Testament that God warns them. You know, there's going to be a time where I'm going to withdraw from you. I'm going to hold back my grace from you because you're going to reject me. But that time will come to an end, and I will save a remnant of my people. Okay? So, yes, they are a race, and yes, they are a religion. Okay? So, there's that answer. Second question that we had. Whoops, that was the same question. Who were the Nicolaitans, and what did they believe? Now, if you are familiar with the book of Revelation, we see several condemnations for churches because they adhered to the teaching or, or put up with the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Uh, the Nicolaitans, historically, they are adherents to, uh, if you look in Acts, I believe it's chapter 7, with the establishment of the deacons. There were seven men chosen out, to help with the distribution of the food so that everybody would receive it equally and the, the elders of the church would not be burdened with that and dis be distracted from praying and preaching the word. One of the men of the seven was Nicholas. N Nikolai in, in, in the Greek. He is supposedly the founder of this faith. Now, there's two lines of thought. One lay it directly to him that he became such an adherent to the grace of God that he allowed and actually encouraged sin, thus that grace would abound all the more. Okay? Uh, it is believed by both lines of thought that his wife actually had two husbands. Um, so the, the camp that believes he founded this says that he was just sexually immoral and, and allowed his wife to have a second husband and, and anything went. Okay? 
The other line of thinking, and, and both of these have ancient writings that subscribe to them. So I, I kind of believe that it's probably somewhere in the middle. The other line of thinking is that he was so caught up in God and wanted nothing to distract him from his relationship with God that he forsook relationship with his wife. But knowing that scripture would require him to fulfill his duties as a husband, he felt torn between the two and allowed her to remarry. Okay? So then the adherence of that took that as permission to live however they wanted. Uh, the Nicolaitans' primary belief was indulgence. Whatever I want goes, because God's grace is so magnificent, it'll cover anything. Okay? So the Nicolaitans uh, professed God, they professed Christ, but they lived like the world. And actually, the way that it's portrayed is they actually exceeded the world in the world's sin, because they thought this would have just incur more grace unto them. Okay? So... Those are the two questions we had today. Are the Jews a race or a people? Yes. Who are the Nicolaitans? They were a group of people that subscribed to the theories of Nicholas, that they um, lived for themselves and to satisfy the lusts of the flesh, and they believed that this just incurred more grace to them than those of us that actually said, well, no, God says that, that we are to be holy and to be pure. So um, hopefully that answers both of those questions for you. If you have any questions, please write them down on the thing. You can put them up in the box, or you can hand them to me. Um, I may not get to it each, you know, I may not get to it the next week, but I will get to it as quickly as I can. So, we have a special guest speaker today, um, the intern. Yes, that's capital I, the intern. Uh, Josh is, has prepared a, a word for today, and I'm going to turn the service over to him and let him just share with us what God has put on his heart. Well, I think prepared is probably an under or overstatement. Mm -hmm. um, I wish. Um, God first laid this, this message on my heart uh, about two weeks ago, and I, I really struggled with this because if there is one thing that I suck at, this is it. <laughs> so I'm just going to share with you guys what I've found out um, in looking up this subject, and I'm not going to tell you what it is yet because we have to get there slowly, kind of a process. So we're going to jump right in. And I want to read one of the Westminster Shorter Catechisms, and just a little bit of background on that. Um, catechism is, let me just read the definition for you, it's a summary of the principles of Christian religion in the form of questions and answers. Okay? Many of you are probably familiar with this, so you'll probably recognize it, but a little bit of history on where this came from. Um, in the mid-17th century, the Westminster Assembly from England um, put together this, this catechism over a um, series of about, about 10 years. And the idea was to bring, bring the church together and also to unite with the Scottish church because there was a lot of wars and, and disputes and things going on at the time. So the idea was to bring everything together and just get kind of a list of things that, that were solid biblical beliefs that you could go down and you could say, okay, here's a question, here's the answer to that question. And so there's 107 of these question, questions and answers in the short catechism. There's also a, a larger one, but we're not even going to touch that today. The first question is, uh, I want to see if any of you guys can quote it. Can anyone quote it? First question. Westminster what short catechism. Okay, you'll probably recognize this. What is the chief end of man? <laughs> or in more modern, modern English, what is man's primary purpose? Nick, I know you know this. <laughs> to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. There we go. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That, that is the, the answer to the first question. What is the primary purpose of man? To glorify God 
and enjoy them forever. So that's what I want to look at today. And I just wanted to go over a couple of the scriptures that the Westminster Catechism uses to support the answer to this question. And so if you would, flip over in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verse 31. We're going to split this up into two parts. Glorifying God and then enjoying forever. So this is scriptural support for glorifying God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31 says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. That's pretty simple. Do all to the glory of God. So... Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, so that includes everything and excludes nothing. nothing. We do it all to the glory of God. What is the glory of God? Praise. Praise? <coughs> okay. Something that brings honor to God. Okay. How about just... Living your life in a way that glorifies him, that honors him, the way that he has called us to live. When I first read this, um, the glory of God, I was thinking glorifying him as in praising him, as in like worship, as in uh, reading your Bibles and praying. But the more and the more I got into it, I started to realize it's, it's also just, just living your life the way he has called you. That is glorifying to God. That is what he desires of us. Let's take a look at another verse in Romans Romans chapter 11. I'm just going to back up a little bit. We're going to start over in verse 33. Chapter 11, verse 33 of Romans. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind, mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Verse 36, I'm just going to read again because that, that's a very cool verse and that's kind of what I want to focus on here. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And so, we are to glorify God. That, that is our primary purpose here on earth, to glorify God. We are to, to serve him, to do everything. Everything that we do should point back towards him. That, that is where our focus should be. And now I want to look at, at the second part of that, um, some scriptural proofs for enjoying him. And then we're going to get into this a little bit deeper. So, if you would flip over to Psalms, chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 5. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night, also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so what he's saying here is, God has done all these things, therefore our hearts are glad, therefore we have joy, therefore, as the Catechism says, we can enjoy it. 
One more in Philippians 4.4. 4. Can anyone quote this one? Rejoice in the Lord always. I say again, rejoice. I think we've all heard that. So those are kind of some of the scriptures that, that the Westminster Assembly used in support for this, this question of, to answer this question of what is man's primary purpose to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So now I want, to, I want to take a look a little bit deeper into this and look at some of the ramifications of this, how this affects us. Well, first of all, we're not the point, is what this tells me. If our primary purpose is to glorify God, that means that we are not the point. We are not the sun that everything revolves around us. And God is the sun and everything revolves around him. And that is to be our primary purpose, is to glorify him and thereby enjoy him. Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. And I think that goes right along with glorifying him, is loving him. Um, I think we get, we get caught up all too often in, you know, we, we think we're doing things for God. We think, yeah, yeah, I know God's the point. I know I'm not the point. But is that how we really live? Because I know that's not how I live most of the time. I, I've already shared this is, this is one of my biggest struggles is glorifying God and just being in that mindset of it's not about me, it's about Him. And I think we, we tend to think, yeah, I got this. I mean, yeah, of course God's the point. I'm not the point. But do we really believe that? Because how would, how would we change our lives if we really believed that was really true and we did that with all of our hearts? What would change? Would we ever be insulted? <clears throat> Would anyone be in need? Because if it's not about me, it's, it's about God. What is the second greatest commandment that Jesus said? The first is love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. And the second is like it. Love your, love your neighbor as yourself. And so first we go to God, and then we go everywhere else. We, we don't get to ourselves. I wanna, wanted to bring up that um, there's, there's kind of a, a cycle that goes on. I've, I've noticed this pattern a lot in Scripture where God will say something like, you know, we're, we are to glorify Him and we're also to enjoy Him. But it's interesting because if you start looking at how this works, you realize that when you start glorifying God and, and living for Him, you get joy out of that. You get peace. Okay, you get a f fulfillment. But what's that cause you to do? That causes you to glorify God all the more, which causes you to have more joy. And so you get into this, this circular cycle that, that is amazing. And that's how I think God designed it to work. And so that's kind of what we're looking to do here is, is to glorify God and then receive his joy and let that joy cause us to glorify him even more. Um, something else that also struck me was this is running the race. This is what running the race is always about, all, all about. Because when we glorify God, that, that should be our focus. Okay, if, if I've always imagined the race where um, it's like there's this road, and off to the sides you have all of these distractions. And it's a narrow road, you know, there's offshoots, there's, there's distractions, loud, loud sounds, big, big signs, um, billboard signs. And then along the road, there's, there's obstacles. They could be little obstacles or they could be huge. And if we start focusing on those, we get off the path or we stop moving. And what I think all this is about is, is putting our focus where it needs to be on God. Because what happens is, as soon as you put your focus on God, you're not paying attention to any of this stuff in your walking. And as soon as you start walking, when you get to an obstacle, God will move it for you. When you start focusing on an obstacle, you lose your focus, and you're stuck at that obstacle. And that's what I think this glorifying God is all about, is putting your focus on Him where it should be. And as soon as we do that, all of the stuff in this world that distracts us will start to fade away. And so, we are to glorify God by enjoying him, and we are to enjoy him by glorifying him.
if that makes sense. I'll say it again. We are to glorify God by enjoying Him. Because when we enjoy Him, we are, we are in His presence, we are doing His will, and thereby glorifying Him. And when we are glorifying Him, we are filled up, and we have fullness of joy. <clears throat> so that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you guys today. Um, this is something that, it's, it's funny because as soon as I, uh, I decided to do this, this message, um, the last two weeks, I, it's been absolutely horrible for me with this. Uh, it, it's, been, it's been really, really difficult, especially the last two or three days. And so, it just um, has shown me how this is so important that we get our focus where it needs to be, on the cross, on Jesus Christ, on God, and we run that race and don't look at the things around us. We put the blinders on and we focus on God and he will take care of everything else. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for being here today, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would, you would bless these people, Father. I ask that you would continue to guide them and lead them, Lord, that we would keep our focus on you. And I thank you for your son's sacrifice on the cross, Father. I thank you that you made a way. Lord, I ask the rest of this day that, that you would be with us all, Lord, that you would continue to lead us and guide us. And I thank you. In your name, amen. amen. You guys might be out here a little bit earlier today. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> He asked me if I had a message prepared. Nope. <laughs> um, thank you, Josh. <clears throat> a couple of things that I would like to share with you, just completely separate from what Josh is talking about. Um, I have posted a number of things to the Jesus Community Church Facebook page. Um, I would like it if you guys have the opportunity to go out and look. Um, we tend to be very egocentric in our worldview everything revolving around us, okay? We look at how things directly affect us. Josh just shared, you know, that's really not the scriptural principle, okay? We need to be looking at what's going on in the world, specifically as relates to Israel. Um, I posted an article written by uh, the author of the book Harbinger, so I know a number of you have read that book. He was actually addressing the United Nations uh, he and a number of Christian and Jewish pastors, or, or rabbis and pastors, were invited to speak. And his message was on the persecution of the, the church, the Christian church. And how um, worldwide the church is facing persecution such as we haven't seen since Nero and Domitian, where uh, it's not just ISIS. You know, we see ISIS and we see Boko Haram, but we, have, we still have governments who will jail you for professing Christ. We have governments who will torture you for having a Bible. We have governments that, that will kill you if you do not recant your faith in Christ. And we have over 100 countries that have this as their, their government. Okay, and in America, we're frustrated because our taxes and because our politics and because things are not the way that we want them. Uh, keep your eyes open. There are a number of issues before the Supreme Court in this upcoming year that I think will directly impact the Christian church in America. Um, quite honestly, I fully expect a lot of you as roommates in my cell <laughs> and the rest of you to come visit. <clears throat> Um, but the church, you know, we look forward to, oh, the, the coming persecution. Guess what, folks? It's here. It's here. Uh, and we see no moral outrage for what's going on to Christians worldwide. Most countries just don't want to be bothered. That's, that's just let it go. We are seeing genocide based on a faith system. Now, what's amazing, at one and the same time, I also listen to Voice of the Martyrs in their podcasts, and the last couple that I've listened to, 
Uh, they've been interviewing Tom Doyle, who heads up a ministry to evangelize Muslims. And, uh, you know, we hear a lot about the displacement of 80,000 Christians from northern Iraq by ISIS. <clears throat> you realize that there were 70,000 Muslims also displaced because their particular ideology, their faith in Allah, was not that of ISIS, and so they were displaced as well. Now, what we don't hear is that the Christians who have lost everything and are moving into these huge camps are reaching out to these Muslims who have also lost everything. There is a revival going on over there that we can't even comprehend, much less we ever get to hear about. And the Muslims are saying, it was our brothers that cast us out, but it's our brothers that are doing nothing to help us. It's these Christians who have nothing that are stepping up to help us. And they are turning from their faith and coming to a faith in Christ that is a real faith and is an eternal faith. Now what else is interesting is this guy says, there's, there's uh, Tom Doyle, he says that through their various ministries, it's not just these moderate Muslims, a lot of the radicals are turning as well. And we're talking about people that have beheaded children, that have set people on fire in the name of Allah. And they do these things giving their utmost to their God, quite honestly. What is Allah? He's a demon. Scripture makes that clear. And they're realizing how fruitless their faith is. There's a, a story that he told of four children, Christian children, that were taken in a village, and they were told to recant, to proclaim Allah. And they said, we will never forsake Yahshua HaMashiach. All four of them were slaughtered right there in front of their parents. But you know what? It had a greater impact on those doing the killing, because if their God can inspire such faith in their children that they will refuse to recant in the face of death, where are we? Where are we? An even greater work, I believe, is going on because these families that have been displaced, that have had everything taken from them, oftentimes seeing fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, children slaughtered, <clears throat> they're learning forgiveness. And what forgiveness is all about. <clears throat> Because they're looking at these Muslims and saying, I have every right to hate you. But God has forgiven me. And I can do no less than to forgive you. And this simple forgiveness is reaching the hearts of thousands of Muslims. Okay? So, keep your eyes open we are part of a body that 80% of is being abused. And 20% of wants to bury its head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. Keep your eyes open, guys. We're in the end times. Okay? Jesus said it would happen. He said rejoice because you know that the end is near. I, I personally, I don't look forward to being abused. I don't look forward to the things that my brothers and sisters around the world are facing. An amazing thing, these Iraqi and Iranian Christians, they're not asking that the trials would cease. That is never in their mind. They're asking that they would endure the trial to his glory. So keep your eyes open, folks, because things are happening at an accelerated rate, and that, that should give us great hope. Don't fear. What, what can they do? Kill you? Great. I go to heaven. Abuse you? Fantastic. We're considered worthy. That the name of Christ might be preached. That is our goal. That is our aim. Okay?